So if, you, if you've seen this talk before, it's the same talk. So you can go to another talk if you want. Uh, all right, I, I guess the, the everyone who's here is here, uh, who wants to be here is here. So uh, welcome. This is about logical application of Postgres 10. I'm Peter Eisenchart. I've, I'm a longtime Postgres contributor and uh, work for Second Quadrant. Postgres Go Services and Postgres Development. Down there's my email address and my Twitter. And you know, obviously this is gonna be linked from the um, um, schedule. So you can find all that information later. Uh, so what, what I wanna do is just uh, show a demo and then we'll talk about some theory and have some slides. So. So this is Postgres 10, right? We have Postgres uh, 10 beta 1 is out as of a week or so ago. So you can uh, you know, download that and then test, test that out. Obviously, it's still going to be a, a couple months until that's final. So this is a, sort of a preview, but you, you're, you know, you're encouraged to um, play with it and, and then test it and report back if you, if you don't like how it works. So just going to show a demo. So we're, I'm going to set up two instances and replicate some stuff between them, right? Since this is going to be on the same machine, they're going to have two different ports. Uh, other, other, other than that, uh, it's going to be a real um, setup. So one data directory. So here we're just going to use two different port numbers so we can keep them apart. In reality, they would be on different hosts, right? And now, and now in, in this case, I have to give an option, wall level logical. You would put this in the configuration file normally, right? Just kind of illustrate that here. And I'll explain later why you need to do that. So now Postgres is running. This is also nice. In Postgres 10, the default log output is a little bit more useful. So there's a timestamp now. By This is all default settings, right? So the timestamp and PID is there by default now. And you also get some kind of useful output back there that's new on what ports is listening and stuff like that. So that's just a unrelated uh, change. So that's one host. I'm going to make another one. Data directory 2. Postgres data directory 2 port 2. So in this case, I don't have to give any wall, wall level anything else. So it's just running now. All right, so I got two instances now, right? So I'm going to leave these running in the terminal here. Going to create a test database in the first one. Create DB test. So connect it to test. Create a table. Yeah. Column name here. Okay, put some data into it. This is kind of my standard test data here because it's kind of easy to see what's going on. So now we got a table with some data. I want to replicate it. So now comes a new thing. I'm going to create something new that's called a publication. So there's a new command: create publication, and you just give it a name: my pub. Or table test one. Okay, so that you know ran pretty quickly. It didn't do much. Uh, what a publication does is basically just groups tables that you want to replicate into some kind of a named uh, named grouping. In other systems, you might call this a replication set. Maybe that's you've seen that maybe in in, in uh, you know existing systems. So this is just the, the same term for just grouping some tables. It doesn't allocate any resources really or anything. It's just a, a way to refer to that. So you can, you know, there's system catalogs that kind of belong to that. You can see, uh, you know, name and IDs and some attributes there that we'll, we'll come back to later. 
There's also a backslash command uh, for this in PSQL, but all the good letters were already taken, so it's DRP. <laughs> uh, you know, P DP was already taken and DR was already taken, so we kind of have big R's for replication, perhaps. Yeah. So that's just the way it goes if you have you know these kind of commands. <laughs> you run out of letters after a while. You know, and you can also, if you go look at the table, it tells you what publication it's part of, just as a sort of a hint. So that, that's all set on the, on the sending end. Now we have to set up the receiving end. So that's going to be, uh, so this is all per database. So you got to set up the receiving database. And it could, you know, it could have any name, but we'll just keep sort of the same name. So that's on the second one, okay, PSGO. Okay, so that's gonna be the target database. It's currently empty, <coughs> presumably, yep. And one thing this does not do yet is replicate your schema. So you have to set that up yourself. This you know, might be a future uh, feature, but right now you have to set up, the, uh, you have to set up your uh, target schema yourself. And you could, Use you know PG dump obviously to kind of move that over. Just in you know PG dump schema only, dump it out, move it back in, then you have a copy. So you have to do that. And so we have a table now. There's nothing in it. Now we want to replicate some stuff into this. So the opposite of a publication is a subscription. So you got to create a subscription. My sub, but maybe. So the subscription needs mainly two pieces of information. One is where does it connect to? So there's a argument here, connection, which is gonna be a connection string, like libpq kind of connection string. So in this case, it's gonna be port, the other guy's over there, and database name was test. And then the publication, so it knows what tables to pull. So we have publication, my, up. Right. So now I told you it did something. So it's a, it's a synchronized table state. That means it's copied the initial data from the tables and created a replication slot, uh, which, uh, if, you know, that's an existing concept. If you've seen that, a replication slot basically just means it's regi it registered itself on the sending end. So the sending end knows to, you know, hold on to the information that needs to be replicated. All right, so now, let's see. There you go, there it is. So that's replication, okay, any questions? <laughs> 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 that was a question there. Well, you didn't have to create tables, though. That was just so we could see they're empty. You would have replicated the DDL too, right? No, it doesn't do that. That's why I mentioned, no. That, that could be a future feature, but it doesn't. Question, Joe. Could that connection string be the URI style as well? Yeah, yeah, connection string could be UI or Obviously, you can have usernames, passwords, and stuff if you need that kind of stuff, right? So let's just kind of see that it actually, you know, can do a couple more things here. See that it's actually updating. Okay. All right, so it works. <laughs> so here's. Uh, We'll get to that. Those are the question was if you have more more tables in the in the subscription, the publication can have more than one table, right? and uh, so if you had more than one table, they would all <coughs> system catalog. We'll get into some slides with some of these details. This is just kind of a demo, right? So system catalog, D R S shows that. <coughs> There's also if you wanna monitor this for like replication lag and that kind of stuff. There's, it's very similar to a physical replication that you might be used to already. So on the sending end, it's exactly the same stuff. PG stat replication. It's the same table. It's just a uh, you know, different consumer on the other end, but doesn't care. You have all the LSNs there and the, the lag stuff that's new in Postgres 10 would show up there. And, and synchronous replication stuff is also there. We'll, we'll get back to that. So that's the same stuff. You have 
um, PG replication slots is the same thing if you were looking at that. On the receiving end, there's something new. There's PG stat subscription. So this is the, if you use physical replication, you might use PG stat wall receiver. And then you compare PG stat replication to a wall receiver so you can kind of see how far along the LSNs are different. So this is the equivalent of that. Yes, Chris? Can you see the uh, structure of the test uh, of the table on the subscriber? Can you see the structure? Backslash D. Um, yeah, it's, it's a normal table. You created it yourself. Right. Uh, yes, the, so for the audio, the qu question there was, or the comment was that in, in systems like Slonian and Lodison, they do that too. They protect the receiving tables from manual updates. This doesn't do that. You can do that yourself, but the intention is also that you can write to it anyway if you want to. Yeah, okay. So we'll get, we'll get back to some of the details. So there's, you know, this is how you would sort of build up a monitoring system around that you can compare the, the LSNs on these different sites. So this is, it's built on the same I infrastructure as the as physical application really. So all the, these concepts here are all the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, instead of for the, when you create a subscription, you have to put a connection string in. His, his comment or question was to could, was there any thought about using the foreign server um, infrastructure to store the connection information? There has been there was a thought about that, but we kind of decided to go ahead with this in the inter interest of simplicity. There are some ideas about maybe have sort have sort of a node registry in this in the future, so you can and. How do you how do you generalize that? It, there's a, some kind of questions about that. So this is kind of you know the, the the simplest thing that will work, and then we'll build it out. And so so there was a demo. Obviously, as you can see, there are not too many moving pieces here. There's just publication subscriptions, and then some monitoring tables around that. The uh, devils in the details, as they say, right? So. Why even do this? I think it's not going to, you know, take over from physical application just for your basic standby, because physical application is just a, you know, it, it works. You get a full copy if the old server goes up in flames. You have a full copy and you use that one. This is more like if you have sort of more nuanced uh, and specific use cases. One big one, anything where you want to just replicate part of a server, part, you know, one database couple tables, part of a table, certain actions on a table, or you know, any kind of like, or you want to archive things but not delete things, or you want to, you know, aggregate, you aggregate multiple databases into one database, anything that is not an exact one-to-one -one copy. So many use cases around that in terms of archiving or, or creating sort of a data warehouse or anything like that. So that's one big use case. Cross version is upgrades, the second one. <laughs> so that's the other big use case that we hope to, to achieve with this. Obviously, that's not going to happen until we have Postgres 11, because we can't upgrade from you know, an old version that doesn't have this into this. So that's going to be sort of a future thing. But yes, that's definitely something we want to do that you, know, you set up a 10 and 11. You just say publication, subscription, and then everything just ends up there. And uh, Build an extension that could be a provider, maybe, or a publisher for an older version. Um, that's that's an interesting idea, I guess. On the uh, on the subscription side, this would be kind of hard because we kind of fiddle with some internals to make that work. But on the publication side, well, that well, might I, work. I, I mean um, I think that might be a little hard. Uh, for, if you want to upgrade from 9.6 to 10, you can use PG Logical. It gets you the same kind of functionality. So uh, that, that, 
I think that might be hard to do because we have to fiddle with some stuff with replication slots. So it's not exactly, you can't exactly backport this that easily. So that might be hard. So basically those are the two big ones or any other situation where phys physical application doesn't work. And that could include things like you want to partition stuff differently or the collation changed or between different platforms or anything like that, right? So th th that would be, those would be the, the use cases. And you know, it's kind of sort of a, you can think of your own thing, basically, right? I have a slightly unrelated question. Um, is there, as far as I know, when a slot is start to be used, yeah. if it gets not being used, I mean, stops being in use because it replicates the subscription dies. Yeah. It's going to grow and grow and grow. I mean, it's not. Yeah, the replication slot There's behavior is the same one as you have now. Nothing has changed in the way to control, to have a bound. No. So his question is, if you have a replication slot, this is the same thing as you have with physical application. If you have a replication slot, but then you don't consume anything from it anymore, the wall information on the sending side is going to be retained indefinitely, and then your disk will fill up. So the, the ideas there were that to, to limit replication slots in some way to on, on based on like time, maybe, or, or disk volume or something, but that, that's not implemented. But that would be a sort of an independent feature that would be useful for, for others as well. So yeah, I, I, mean, I believe that's a big problem. Yeah. Because you cannot control subscribers and if they die, then your your primary server goes out at yeah. some point in time. So yeah, that's a underlying problem. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah I understand. Yes, that's something we do, we're definitely thinking about. Yeah. So what about these things that you might have heard of? One of the things that I saw in the hacker news thread on on when the beta one was announced, it's like, oh great, they merged BDR into Postgres. So that's not uh, quite correct. So if you don't know what these are, uh, BDR is, is bi-directional replication. That's a, a fork of Postgres that was started around the 9.2, 9.3 timeframe that basically implemented a lot of the infrastructure that we now use for logical application that includes logical decoding and commit timestamps and uh, rep, um, origin tracking and, event triggers and then a bunch of these things to implement a multi-master replication system. And that's an open source project that you can download. And all of these features were basically fed in back into Postgres one by one until, you know, basically in 9.6, all of them were merged back in. So the next version of BDR is just going to be an extension. So that was sort of the origin of all this logical replication business that's been going on for many years now in the Postgres community. And because, but because BDR is kind of a specialized product, it's, you know, it, it's very fairly complicated to manage because you have all these different nodes that all need to be aware of each other and so on. So the next step there was PG Logical is an extension that basically just does one-to-one -one replication as an extension. And one of the it, original proposals around 9.6 was to just merge that into Postgres. But then people said, we don't want an extension, we want to build in. So we started again in Postgres 10 and just basically took the same tech that's in PG Logical and just made it, it's, it put a different interface on, on it. So that's how it looks now. But if you've seen these or use these or wondering about these, these are basically different interfaces around the same technology, but they're not compatible with each other. So you can you know, use PG Logical to replicate into the in-core stuff in Postgres 10 or anything like that. But what I mentioned earlier, if you want to now, if you're interested in doing something like this for upgrading from 9.6, you're invited to use PG Logical. That does get you almost the same stuff. But those are separate products or projects that are not this. Yes, question. Just a question, is the feature set, I understand they're not directly compatible, is the feature set for PG Logical equivalent to the feature set that's going into 10? Is the feature set of PG Logical equivalent to the stuff that's in Postgres 10? No. Uh, PG Logical has more sort of practical features. It can, for example, like internally run PG Dump to copy your schema and stuff like that. It has like some filtering functionality. It can output JSON. So, so you can- Filtering doesn't, doesn't apply to the built-in? No, these are all things that we could do based on what we know, but it's not <laughs> done, right? So. So PG Logical has a lot more stuff. You can, uh, you know, filter. You can. It has origin tracking. You can do a small amount of conflict handling based on timestamps, for example. So it is. It is 
has more functionality in that way, but it's also worse in some other ways because it doesn't have, it doesn't, it's only an extension. And we had, we did a fair amount of internal fiddling also in Postgres 10 to do, do, do certain things more efficiently. So they're both trade-off. The long-term plan here is definitely to merge all of that back into Postgres, but you know, it has to go through the community processes and be cleaned up. So in the long term, you know, a couple of releases from now, we, we hopefully have most of the functionality in, in core. So we don't want to, you know, have these around as separate projects indefinitely. All right, so good questions. Uh, so this is basically another sort of picture that summarizes what we already alluded to earlier. So everything's pro database. You can have you know, multiple publications in one database. You can have multiple tables in the publication. They can overlap and, and things like that. And you can also you know, have uh, multiple subscriptions. One subscription can sub subscribe to multiple publications and then things like that. So it's all sort of many-to-many -many mappings. Um, uh, yeah. uh, are tables Kevin? matched up on qualified table names? Yes. <laughs> See, I already gave this presentation once, and I watched it, and I filled in all the gaps that people asked me questions about. <laughs> so, I have other questions. You're answering them all right there. So every, everything is, is you know, obviously, these are distinct systems. In, a, in the same system, everything is sort of linked together by OIDs, but these are separate systems. So the way everything is linked together is by, by name. So the, ta the, the tables have to have the same name. The columns have to have the same names. It's possible to have different orders, uh, and it's also possible that the uh, receiving end has more columns that they'll just be filled in with nulls if you know constraints, uh, check constraints and such allow. Uh, data is shipped in text format. That might be also one of those like future improvements. Maybe you do some binary format or something, but right now it's text format, so that's also good for upgrades and that kind of stuff, so you so have the most sort of compatible representation. Um, and, and you know, types are also mapped by name. It, it, since it's text format, the types don't exactly have to be the same in, in a way, because it's just as long as whatever text is being sent fits in, it will work. That also helps in case you do some kind of upgrades or uh, variants of that. And, and you are allowed to change the tables on the fly. and. Uh, you know, appropriate things will happen. I mean, it will it will work. So if you add a column, let's say you add a column on the receiving end, that's fine as long as it allows null values. It will just the rows will just keep uh, filling in, and you will have null values in your extra column. Let's say you add a column on the publication end. As soon as you will, as soon as you put data into that column and it ships and the column is not there yet on the receiving end, then it'll just error until you make that column. Um, and, and yeah, yes, question. Sorry, is, uh, is it possible to use this in conjunction with the new partitioning? Is it possible so to use this in conjunction with the new partitioning? If oh. partition and subscribes maybe from one side and maybe on the other side a child part partition subscribes from, so they both are part of a partition hierarchy? You want to replicate sort of in two different directions. Using two separate partitions. Yes, you can do that. So all of this is just one way, but what he's kind of alluding to is having partition, so multiple partitions on both ends, and one partition replicates that way, and the other partition replicates that way. So you can kind of build a multi-master that way if you're, you know, you're, you're if you only ever write to that one partition. So you can make that kind of stuff work, yeah. So. But sort of the point is here, it's going to be much more robust against schema changes uh, compared to sort of these sort of trigger-based systems that we, we had in, in the past. Lots of questions. Let's kind of go there. Yeah. Yes. You want to replicate all the tables in one schema? Right. You would have to enumerate them. That's probably on the next uh, slide as well, isn't it? It's right there. 
so there's four all tables. I get to that in a second. We'll go through the questions. Uh, yes. So you mentioned that it'll continue to error if you if you create a new table or change a column or change a table on the publishing side of things. And yeah. The, the column doesn't exist on the receiving side. Yeah. When you said it, it'll continue to error out until you create it. Yeah. Is it queuing up those inserts? Yes. Or queuing up those those mutations? It will queue up the inserts or the the change records until you consume them, basically. Okay. So it, it'll eventually. Yes. Chris, yes. And it's saving raw files to do that? It'll just, it'll, it will not be consumed from the replication slot until it's sort of acknowledged, right? So that kind of how it works. Chris, yes. How do things blow up if primary keys are missing? That's sort of one of the technical details I was going to mention later. So yes, you do, it, you do kind of need a primary key on these tables in order to locate what you need to update. This is something that's called the replica identity that you might have seen somewhere in the alter table man page that otherwise is never used. Um, if you don't have a primary key, you can still publish inserts because they will just be appended. But if you try to do an update and you don't have a primary key, it will complain. Um, and you can then also do replica identity full, which means you make the whole row the key and, and things like that. It, that also determines what the key is that gets shipped with the information. So if you, you want to make that as small as possible. So, all right, so here, here's sort of the, we saw create publication earlier. These are kind of some of the variants you can do. So you can have multiple tables, you can have all tables. That addresses your use case of, that. that is all the tables now and in the future. So if you can either have an explicit list or you can have all the tables in the database. There's no all tables in the schema. That's not, doesn't exist if you, if you were hoping for that. And you can also have some options of only publishing certain actions, like only publish maybe inserts and updates, don't publish deletes. Maybe that's useful for like a archiving kind of application. That's just, you know, you can find your own use case for that question, yes? Can you publish a subset of a table? No, you would have to partition it then and you can make that work maybe. How would you, like based on what criterion would you? Um, no, I mean that, that's, you know, that's the sort of thing I mentioned that PG Logical might do and that we might add in the future, but we don't have that right now. Yeah. And you can change the publications later on if you if you want to you know add tables maybe or just replace the whole set of tables or remove some tables if you don't like them anymore. You know, that's standard stuff basically, and then you can drop them. <laughs> so question. Sorry, quick related question to that question. Um, can you omit columns in any way? Like mm. if you're on the receiving side say, oh take this column but just make it null essentially? Or on the sending side, not send a certain. No, there, no. Again, the, uh, you can you can al you can already think of lots of ideas. Like I want to filter by column, by row. I want to just map this column to that if, because I renamed everything. And yeah. uh, all of these could be future features, right? But like right now, it's probably possible to do, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's just column by column. Question here, then we'll do yeah, that. The question that I got is: uh, Is it possible for a uh, for a subscription to have multiple? Can one subscription point to multiple publications? Yes. Okay. It, on in the same database, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so that you they share a primary key and they. Can Which is it. actually the same. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question, Robert? <laughs> when, when it gets applied to the table on the subscriber side, does it go through all the normal like SQL query semantics? Like if, it triggers the if, or yes, or if something gets applied. If something gets applied on the subscribing end into a table, yes, triggers apply, constraints apply, if foreign keys apply, so yes. So if you want to do a bastardized idea of like we're going to mess with the data, not have certain columns go in. Triggers, yes, we'll yeah, sure, sure, yeah, yeah, triggers would be good for that, yeah. yeah. All right, so yeah, we, we kind of saw that example already when we did the demo connection. You need to know where to go, and then the publication is just which tables to graph, that's it. And then there's some options for special cases you can play with. You can have the subscription initially disabled, so it, it will sit there but not do anything. That's just if you need to do like network maintenance or something, you just stop it, basically. 
And then there's some options for application slot handling. And um, that basically is mainly intended for PG dump. If you dump out a database, and if you were to, you know, it dumps all these statements out, like create subscription, so it re reproduces that when you restore it. But you don't necessarily want the subscription to start up right away as soon as, you're, as, soon as you restore it. Because maybe you just want to have a copy for testing, right? You don't want that to connect out back to where you originally subscribed to. So what pgdump does, it, it uh, creates all subscriptions in a disabled state. And then you have to go in and enable them if that's what you want to do, depending on what, why you're restoring. So that's what some of these options are for, or if you know, for some reason you want to name the replication slot in a different way. Or and then the last option there is if you want to do the initial data copy or not. So as we saw, what it does is when you create a subscription, it internally runs a kind of a copy command just to copy the initial data. And then it syncs it up with a with this change stream. And then it tells you you're good to go. But you can omit that. So you just get the new data, and you just omit the old data if you want. So some of the options there for you know, certain special use cases. So, and then you can have alter commands to change that if you want to enable and disable, as I mentioned. Or change, you know, maybe you move the host or rename something. You can change the connection. It's pretty straightforward. So it, this is kind of the fiddly part, because if you want to so it create so you have your subscription here. You create a subscription. It reaches out to the publication site and creates a slot there. So it, the publication site knows to hold on to the stuff to send. That's what we mentioned earlier. And if you drop a subscription, it does the same thing. It goes and drops the replication slot, so all that is cleaned up. That's what we want. But if you if the maybe the publication site is, is gone, the host is no longer there, or you can't reach it, or it's, you know, the drop subscription would fail, because it will try to reach out, it's not there, and it'll fail. So you have to use these kind of things to, to kind of you know, tell it that the slot is no longer there, and then you can drop it. So those are kind of fiddly options that are necessary, because you have that kind of these distributed failure cases. Question in the back, yes? Well, I was pointing at you, actually, if you want to go, but OK. In the, in the back, please, yes. So you create a subscription and the slot already exists in the publisher. Yeah. If the slot already exists in the publisher, we'll tell you the slot already exists. But you can also use that one. And if maybe the, there's sort of certain cases, you can also maybe create the slot manually and just use it. So then you, if you create the. Uh, Create subscription, create slot false, give it a slot name, you're gonna use that one. If the slot already exists, but you were thinking about <laughs> making a new one, then it's just a normal name conflict. Mm -hmm. then, so. If the slot already exists and you say create slot false, will it still synchronize on that or do you have to sort of like force synchronize it? No, the synchronization is independent of that, yeah. Question here done in the middle? Yes. So uh, synchronous commit, like is there any what are the feedback mechanisms that exist if I wanted to do synchronous Synchronous commit uh, works just the same way. Well, your question is synchronous commit? Yeah, um, it was remote, remote apply, right? Syn synchronous commit equals remote apply. Is there like a feedback mechanism so if I'm making a write to the publisher, will that transaction not block? Or is there a way to get feedback so that the transaction will block until it's consumed and applied on the... Yeah, synch synchronous commit works the same way here as, as it works for physical application. So uh, what synchronous commit does is basically the publisher w or the sending side waits with the commit until it's verified to be written on the receiving end, right? Okay. So the feedback, there, there is and there's fe it works the same way, right? There's feedback, and you will have the same behavior if you want to set that. Yeah. All right, so we have that. So this is, again, this is kind of a fiddly part. And you can change the subscriptions. And there's so the, what refresh publication does is if you add tables to the publication, you have to run that. So it gets, goes out and fetches the new tables. So there's you know, a lot of kind of details. If you change things or move things around, you can all update that. So hopefully, the documentation will, will cover that. 
And then you can drop it, of course. So, so here's some configuration settings that are of interest. I said I, I showed wall level logical. So that just means to include in the wall the information for logical decoding. So that's the same stuff here that you need for PG logical or VDR or test contrib test decoding. You know, that's just so the wall contains additional information to make this logical decoding possible. Uh, the the other next two there is are in parentheses because in Postgres 10 the defaults would change, so you don't actually have to set them as you just saw in my demo. So in, in, in previous releases, if you want to do any replication at all, you have to set max wall sanders to something. And if you use replication slots, which you probably should, you also have to set that to something. Now the defaults, I think, are 10 and 10. So you know, for a, a, a small setup, it should be enough. And then if you want to, obviously, if you want to connect to a remote host, you have to set listen addresses and set up your pghbay.com so you can connect. That's just the normal stuff. So uh, we tried in Postgres 10 also, you know, not only because of this feature, but also because of, you know, PG-based backup users and that kind of stuff, just to make it a little bit simpler so the defaults are better. So it's, it's easier to get started. And then on the subscription end, as I, as I showed, you don't actually have to set anything by default, but there are some options to, you know, basically tell how many of various things you want. So you, you, again, replication slots, you don't have to set by default. And now at least someone in this room is probably going to be thinking, wait a second. Why do we need replication slots on the subscriber? And you would be right. Uh, but the replication slot setting also controls how many replication origin tracking slots you need. And if you don't know what that means, just forget about it. Just set that to the same value you have on the, subscribe, on the publisher. Um, Worker process is the same stuff that you use for parallel query. And it's just the same pool of extra processes. So we need one process per subscription, plus initial table sync, plus one launcher process. And then you can also set how many you want specifically for rep logical application. So the, the worker processes <laughs> pool goes for all background workers, and logical application workers is just for us. And then you know parallel query has a separate pool with a similar setting. And, and so on. And then the last one is how many, that, the last one is, is, is kind of nice. Uh, the initial table sync can run in parallel for each table. That's, for example, something that PG Logical cannot do because we had to do some internal fiddling with the slot snapshot business. So by default, that's set to two. So you get two tables being copied in parallel. If you want to do it faster, you can give more, or, you know, less. So that's your choice. Oh. Security stuff in terms of you know how, who is allowed to do this. Um, that's just sort of the initial set that we came up with for Postgres 10. So if you to create a publication, you have to have create privilege on the database. And in order to add a table, you have to be the table owner. So that hopefully makes sense. For subscription, you have to be a local super user. And the only reason for that is really that a subscription enables you to connect to a remote host and you kind of want to restrict that somehow. It doesn't necessarily have to be super user, but we haven't really agreed on a, a lower level privilege bit that could represent that well. It's again, room for future improvement. And on the remote end, so you have two users basically, right? The user that creates a subscription and then the user you connect as, that they don't necessarily have to be the same. And the remote user has to be a replication user. That's the same thing as we had before. And then you need an HBA entry. Um, you know, you could use Scram, hopefully, in Postgres 10. Um, something that was changed, if you have never used lo logical replication before Postgres 10, then this will not affect you. But in before Postgres 10, you had the replication keyword here. So if you use physical replication, you would have host, replication, and then a user and some stuff. And that was the same for logical application. And that was basically an error of the way it was designed. And so we have changed this now. So you have a pro database setting, as you would expect. Question, Joe? I don't know if I understand this. So does it need to literally be a user that has the replication role? Yeah. Can it be any ordinary user that is on the subscription side? To create the subscription in that database, you have to be a super user. But then in the connection string, you have a user. 
But is that an ordinary for, user? Or? That user on the remote end has to be replication, has, has the replication attribute. Which is kind of the same thing you have now if you want to do physical replication, right? So, it, and that, because. The, the reason I ask is that I'm also wondering about the interaction with RLS here. It sounds like. No, I think that was looked. Uh, so he's wondering about how this interrelates with uh, role level security. I think that was looked into when Petro and Stephen talked about it. So we, we could check that again. But uh, I think that that, that that was looked into. All right. So hopefully this is not too surprising. Yeah? I showed these monitoring views. Actually, one thing I didn't show was oh, we're in time here. Oh, we got to hurry up a little bit. One thing that's also new in uh, Postgres 10, independent of this, is that background workers show up in PGSAT activity. So you also see all that stuff happening there. So you have one, one worker per subscription showing up in PGSAT activity, and you can see what it's doing. All right, so here's some other stuff that people already mentioned, what hopefully all just works. So synchronous replication works, as <coughs> I mentioned. And basically, we didn't have to do anything for that. All you have to do is kind of send the feedback when you're done. And all the really interesting action happens on the sending end. Cascading is possible, not really because it's a, cause it's a cascading system like Sloney, but you can, you can have a publication on the same database as a subscription. It will just then do the whole decoding again and keep sending it on. Right? That there's no reason why that wouldn't work. Triggers and constraints work, and writing to subscribe tables, as I mentioned already earlier, as we discussed, works if you want to. If you don't want to, there's facilities to prevent that. Um, you know, triggers, permissions, read-only mode, maybe things like that. So we did. We didn't really want to go into that. So things that don't exist yet, and we already talked about some other, like filtering, column mapping, all that stuff could exist. But Basically, these are sort of the big ones that we know of right now. So schemas are not replicated. We have the infrastructure for that with event triggers. You just kind of have to you know, write event triggers to package that all up, ship it over, unpack it, and put it there. So that, that's something someone can work on. Sequences are not replicated because they're that, you know, the support for that in the logical decoding API doesn't exist. So. They, uh, you know, if you have a serial column, the data in the table obviously ships ar around, but the, the sequence itself will just still sit at the start value. So if you want to do sort of an upgrade or failover kind of scenario, you have to use maybe PG dump to sh just ship your <coughs> sequence data records over. There's also better support for the PG dump in that in P Postgres 10, so it's, mu it's a bit easier as to copy just the sequence set val commands over. But that's obviously something we want to fix eventually. So again, you know, if you, if you, <laughs> if you live through the Sloney evolution, you will also remember Sloney at one point did not replicate truncate. And we are in the same situation now until we figure out how to do that. Uh, it's also not quite clear to me how to actually, what that would actually mean. Because if you delete everything from it, table, we will ship individual delete records over. So we will delete exactly the same rows on the receiving end. And if they don't match, then we don't delete them. And if there are additional rows, we just leave them there. So it's a per record. Whereas a truncate is, you know, what happens if you truncate the table here? Or do you want to truncate everything here, or just the rows? Or there could be multiple opinions on that. So it's not clear if that is sort of, if there's a single answer to that. And right now, it's only, we only replicate base table to base table. So that means you, you can't replicate from a view to a view, for example, or from, a foreign, no, foreign, from something into a foreign table doesn't work. Something involving materialized view doesn't work. If you want to replicate between partition tables, you can only go from the same partition to the same partition. And we talked about that yesterday in the unconference that that's obviously something we want to fix. It was kind of interesting that so partitioning and logical replication, they kind of showed up in Postgres 10 almost around the same time, not sort of knowing about each other ahead of time. And so we've got the, both of these complete features, but they didn't really work together that, all that well. That's just you know, how, how it happens sometimes. So that's definitely something you want to address probably in Postgres 11. So if you have the same partition hierarchy, it'll, it'll work. But if you want to 
change the partition hierarchy, then that this is not going to work. Question in the back? <coughs> is it possible to? Can you? You can't. Well, you can't. You can't create catalog objects on a on a read replica, so you can't create publications on a standby. Yeah, and then there's uh, there's there's a whole bunch of issues uh, that is are mentioned on this slide that address this exact point that the no, this is actually on this side, on this slide. Um, physical application and this logical application don't work together in certain cases all that well. And th th that's really unfortunate, but there's some really tricky issues there. And if you want to, let's say you, you have a physical application pair, right? That's just the normal stuff you have now, but you also have a logical application connection hanging off the mask, so you fail over, you can't just move that connection over. Because the application slots are not replicated, so there's no start point. There are fiddly ways to work around that, but it's weird and that needs to be addressed. But it's it, that, that doesn't work. All right, so I, got, I, I think we kind of got to wrap up here. Um, so I mentioned already in the beginning, physical application is not going away because it just works. It's much easier. I mentioned replica identity handling. That's you know the issue with the primary keys. Um, there's some issues with long-running transactions. That's just the way logical decoding works. It doesn't decode your transaction until it's committed. So if you have a long-running transaction, it will, there will be sort of an appearance of lag because it doesn't start replicating until you commit. Whereas in physical replication, it just ships the bits and bytes over and then it will interpret them later. But it can't do that here. Right? I mentioned how PG dump works. So if you dump a subscription, it'll restore it disabled and then you can decide what to do with it. And you can't really do any fail over fail back with this. That doesn't really make sense, probably. So it's not really an HA solution, probably. Or you, you can have a copy, right, and fail over to that. But then if you want to go back, there's no real way to define where to go, right? So that doesn't work. All right, so what are we going to do in the future? Uh, fix all that in Postgres 11 and beyond, right? This is very similar to Robert's talk earlier, just fix all these things. Um, multi, uh, I mentioned we, we want to get to the point of multi-master, obviously, and then we, do wanna, we don't want to keep around BDR indefinitely, so that will come, but not in 11. And the fixing the integration with physical application that I alluded to, that you know, when you fail over that the replica replication slot information is somehow transported, we have to figure out how to do that. And, um, some more fine-grained security might be nice, so you don't have to be super user for everything. That's just work. You've got to figure out you know, what kind of attributes you want to expose to user commands and that kind of stuff. And all these good, fun ideas that everybody had here about filtering, transforming expressions and, and that kind of stuff are certainly doable and pretty much independent of anything else. You, know, you just have to have a way to kind of package that up into a user interface, and then you can just, you know, put that into the code, say, you know, if this matches my filter, then do that. So that, that shouldn't be terribly hard. It's you know, got to be within reason and then go through code review. All right. Good. So we <laughs> made it in time. So I'm, I'm just sort of the spokesperson here. I did some reviewing and committing of all this. These are all, also some people who did a lot of work. Um, Petr Jelinek is, uh, was the main author of this code actually and he also maintains PG logical so he knows most about this. Andres of course is well known in the community. He did a lot of reviewing this time around and also you know a lot of the prep work in all previous releases. We had Eric Reichers uh, doing all of testing on the mailing list. Uh, Craig is the BDR author and he, he, he does he has a lot of uh, had a lot of feedback. And uh, Masahiko, who I just got to know yesterday, is he here? Uh, Masahiko, he did a lot of testing and then reviewing lately. So also, and you know, a lot of other people, obviously. So right now it's committed. It's out there. It's community property. Obviously, Second Quadrant is going to, you know, some of these people are associated with Second Quadrant as am I. So we're going to keep working on that because that's kind of our thing. But other people have already started pitching in, so it looks pretty good. And, uh, you know, 
Beta 1 is out, so please try it out. And uh, I think we're not going to have questions, but you can grab me privately afterwards. So thanks for coming, and let's go to lightning talks.